بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Um, so I was thinking about what I want to speak about today um, because the war on terror has been going on since 2001 and it's, it's quite a big thing. There are so many different aspects of it that you could literally speak for days on end um, about how it manifests itself, the different ways that it, that it impacts uh, on us. I did a uh, entire talks just on what it does to our biology and how it changes us as a matter of physiology. Um, but I guess, you know, it's our first time in Bolton. I really wanted to kind of send a message, at least my first time, about the really insidious ways in which we have been hurt and harmed around the world. Now, I think all of us here, you know, we recognize that there is a fear of Muslims that comes from, um, from the way in which we've been described by the media, by politicians. They're scared of us. They're scared of Muslim men in particular. And now, especially since Syria and people traveling to Syria, they're increasingly scared of Muslim women too. But why are they scared of Muslim children? And that's what I want to focus on today. I want to focus on the children that I've met in now, I think, almost 16 years of doing field work around the world. The children who I've interviewed, who I've tried to assist in different ways, whose families I've tried to assist. Because largely when we think about the war on terror, we think about Guantanamo Bay, we think of people like Mars and Beg, about the men who have been impacted. At the most, we might think of Afi Siddiqui as a woman who has been impacted. But what about the children? Because when 9-11 happened, you had all sorts of people being picked up all over the world. The very first detentions that took place weren't in Afghanistan. The very first ones immediately within days we're talking about, were in Bosnia and the UAE, of families who had children, who had no idea where their parents were, where they, where they were being detained, what was happening to them, nothing, no idea whatsoever. But even in the UK, we had dozens of men being detained and kept in what was known as internment. This was a form of detention without charge. The government decided immediately, we need to detain these men, and these foreign nationals were put inside prison, I believe it was Belmarsh, and left behind were all of these families who had no idea how to challenge a system that had never been used against Muslims uh, up until this moment here in the UK. How is it possible that, that these men, their fathers, could be detained without charge, without any accusation whatsoever? And so, of course, over the years, these children, they suffered. They suffered immensely from, um, from these detentions because it wasn't a quick process of, well, they're detained and now, you know, the courts have struck it down. It takes years for the courts to strike these decisions down. And even when they do, they bring in a new law, something called control orders, where their fathers were then detained inside their home. And that didn't just affect the fathers. It affected the children as well because all of a sudden the children realized that when... Their friend at school said, oh, can I come round to play? You realize, well, no, you can't because the home office has put a restriction on my house, which means that you as my friend cannot come into my house. It means that my father cannot take me to the playground at certain times. It means that there are a whole series of restrictions on my life, my use of the internet, the use of a mobile phone inside the house. There are all of these restrictions that stop me from being just like everybody else. And so as a child, you become imprisoned by the very system that has imprisoned your father. When financial sanctions were brought in, again, very early on in the war on terror, the fathers were forced to live a 40 pound a week for the whole family. The mothers weren't permitted to earn any money because that would have been seen as subsidizing the father. Neighbors weren't permitted to help, so the whole family had to survive on this small amount of money. What do you think that did to the families? 
70% of the families that I uh, worked on these cases ended up in divorce. And it's, is it surprising if you were the wife of somebody who was told that that's all you are allowed to subsist on and we don't know when we're going to end this process. We're going to have the court system that you can appeal through in secret so you can't see the evidence against you, so that your lawyer cannot see the evidence against you. Do you think that it's possible that a family can stay together in that environment? And yet these families who went through these horrific processes, they fell apart and they fell apart on our watch. That's the reality. This is all starting in 2001. 2003, two of my clients, one of which I met only recently, 2003, two brothers, they're detained in Pakistan. They're taken to a secret location by the CIA. This is all true, by the way. Where they placed inside boxes that are small like coffins, and they are carried to another location and the boxes are opened in front of their father who is being tortured by the CIA. They are shown to their father while the interrogation is taking place. And then they close the boxes, they open a hole in the top and scorpions are fed inside the top. And the father is being asked questions again and again and again. You know, who do you know? Where are the bombs? Where are this? By this stage, by the way, the U.S. Senate Committee report into torture has already recognized by this stage of the interrogation, this man has already given up all the information before this torture even began. This is now what the FBI, in their review of this, called gratuitous torture. There is no reason for this. There is no need for this at this point. But they're doing it because they can. That was 2005, so we've gone from 2001 to 2003, sorry, 2003. Let's move forward to 2005. 2005, I'm in Pakistan again. I'm meeting with a family. And as we're talking, as I'm talking to the wife of a brother who's been made to disappear, again by Pakistani intelligence along with the CIA, who's gone missing into CIA custody. I'm interviewing the mother and I get distracted. I get distracted by the by the image in the periphery of my vision of her daughter, Minal, feeding a picture. And, I, and I, I, I look over and I just move the picture slightly, and it's a picture of her father. This is her world now, where in order for her to retain a connection to her own father, she sits there at dinner times and feeds him food as a way of retaining some kind of connection that this this person who I have no actual memory of, this is my father. This is somebody who I have to try and build a connection with. As a child, she understands that the only way she can do that is through this picture that she has of him. Let's go forward two years again. So we were in 2001, 2003, 2005. Now we're in 2007. I'm in Nairobi. Uh, Ethiopia has just invaded Somalia. A number of people within Kenya a lot of people went, left from Somalia, they came into Kenya to seek refuge. Instead, they were picked up by the Kenya Anti-Terrorism Police Unit, around 70 people. Amongst that group was a young child named Hafsa Saleh Ali. She was four years old. So interviewing Hafsa and her mother, they were kept in separate locations from one another. Hafsa was detained for 30 days without access to a mattress or a blanket. And anybody who's familiar with East Africa knows that the night times in East Africa can get very cold. She was kept in a prison cell with 30 other people, none of whom were her relatives. She didn't know a single one of them, personally. Uh, they had no access to a toilet. It was just a bucket in the corner. There was no mattress, no blanket, cold nights. And Hafsa was so traumatized by this whole incident because, I mean, the reason they, they detained her because they wanted her father, they wanted to find out information about them. They actually interrogated her themselves at gunpoint, a four-year-old. I have a four-year-old, by the way. A four-year-old cannot tell you anything about what you as a father do for a living, about what your activities are, what your comings and goings are. They just know how to play with you. That's it, that's the extent of their understanding of what your relationship is to one another. That this is a person who provides love in my life, 
provides food, provides playtime, and that's it. That's the extent of what they know. So Hafsa, on her release, every single time she would see a man in a uniform, a black man in a uniform, regardless of what his position was. And in the case that uh, her mother was telling me in this moment, it was just a cleaner on the street, but he had a uniform. She would soil herself. Because now she is changed forever. Her association in her mind and her body is to what? Is to men in uniform hurt me and harm me. And so that fear that now she has to work, try to deal with for the rest of her life is part of her physiology. It's not something that she can just get over just like that. Let's go forward again, another two years, to 2009. I'm in, back in Pakistan, in the north of Pakistan, in Peshawar. And I meet a, a family of a man who they say he's been missing since 2003. The brother, he's with me, he's sitting, he's talking, he's telling me about you know, how wonderful his brother is, this one who went, who went missing, who was kidnapped again by the Pakistanis and the CIA. And they said that. We think that he's taken to Bagram. We know you work on these types of missing person cases. Please help us. And the daughters come into the room. They're very young. And they, I mean, they speak in Pashto, so I mean, this is all being translated for me. And the daughters say, they're crying, and they say, we wish. We wish we were men. If we were men, we would go into Afghanistan. We would fight. We would die in order to get our father back. This is what the war on terror has done to them that for them, they see themselves as now products of the war on terror, who, whose lives are preoccupied not just, by, um, not just by the war on terror as a larger kind of manifestation in their life, as something that's going on somewhere, but as something that, that is real for them. And so as they grow up, their obsession is with what? Is with the idea that these people took my father away. What do you think that does to them? Unfortunately, within four months of, of, of me meeting the family, uh, there was an Associated Press article that explained that their father had passed away in 2003, had been killed by the Americans. Uh, he had been uh, left outside in the cold Afghanistan air after having been tortured, and he died of hypothermia. So I rang the family to give my condolences, and the family said, what are you talking about? Nobody's told us. And I realized in that moment that I was the one who was informing them, not the Pakistani government, not the Americans, not the Associated Press, nobody. That nobody had bothered to even tell this family that this big news about the fact that their family member had been killed. And the Americans knew they killed him. Like, like, there's whole reports now that have been written about what took place. I'm sorry, you have to give me a time check. I so this is the first decade of the war on terror. And there are many other cases. I could tell you about Zahra Paracha, whose father is still in Guantanamo Bay, Saifullah Paracha, 70-year-old man. Multiple uh, illnesses he's had, including heart attacks. Zahra Paracha, who, who told me when I met her in Karachi that I live my life looking at my friends, and they're interested in, in shawls and the latest shawar kameez and the latest fashions and latest this, that, and the other. And I'm sitting there clicking, looking at what's happening in Israel and Palestine and Guantanamo. And I think to myself, and this was 14 years old at the time, I think to myself, what's wrong with my friends? Why don't they understand? Why don't they get the fact that they're not normal? And then she said to me, and then I realized that actually it's me. I'm not the one who's normal. Uh, who's normal. I'm not normal anymore. And you understand that the war on terror changes our children fundamentally. The way that they are impacted takes their childhood away from it, deprives them of their childhood, it destroys their childhood. So they become individuals who grow up in a world that is a, con a world of conflict. And, and, that's, and as a larger story, we need to understand that those of us who grew up you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, yeah, we were familiar with racism, but when we were running down the streets away from the skinheads, 
uh, usually our black friends were running alongside with us, right? Like we had an experience of racism that was, was just rooted in whites v. others, all right? Coming to the 90s, that kind of started to, to calm down a little bit. Racism was still very much part of society, but not so open in the ways that it had been previously. So we have a memory of a, of a slight lull for the generation that were maybe 10 years and younger when 9-11 happened, the only world that they have ever known is one that sees them as a problem, is one that sees them as a future threat, is one that problematizes their religion, problematizes their color, problematizes their parents, problematizes every single aspect of their being, so that all they see themselves is as threats. Threats that they have to manage. Now some of our children, they choose to resist, they choose to become activists, they choose to stand up for themselves. But some of them say, I can't deal with the pressure of this in my life, so I would rather cut off my beard and remove my hijab because it's easier for me to exist if I don't show them I'm Muslim. They grow up with this trauma. And we have to understand that. We have to be patient with that. We have to see that this is a real part of their lives in order to help them, get, and in order to help build resilient characters so that for them, we don't just see their lives as being disparate from all of these big things. This is their world, the world that they're growing up with. You have to understand that because you have to help them through it. You have to hold their hand through this. It's not okay to just leave them be and say, you know, just try and figure your own way out through all of this. How long do I have? So that was the first kind of decade of the war on terror. As we move into the second decade, we have violence that's taking place at completely new levels. 2011, a 16-year-old child an American national is sitting on a restaurant with friends and family and the next thing he doesn't exist. He's been destroyed by a drone strike. He's the son of Anwar al-Aki, Abdurrahman, 16 year old, got nothing to do with anything and he's completely destroyed by these drone strikes. The same drone strikes that are destroying families at weddings in the north of Pakistan and Somalia and across Yemen. These are families that are being destroyed, children whose lives are being destroyed. But in his case, he's targeted because of his father, who was killed prior to him. His father doesn't even exist anymore, and yet he's still seen as a threat. It's 2013, the Syrian conflict. It, conf it uses the language of the war on terror, Bashar al-Assad who some people say, oh, he's like anti-Israel, he's like an anti-imperialist and whatever. He uses the language of the war on terror in order to do what? In order to kill the men, women, and children of, of our ummah, whose lives have been completely destroyed. And these same children, who when they come over to European countries, are seen as what? Again, as future threats. So the war on terror, it... It's like a matrix. It reinforces itself everywhere you go. So you're not safe in Syria, but you come over here and you're not safe either because you're seen as being a potential problem, as a potential risk to society. And the only way you can reduce that is by what? Is by reducing your levels of Islam. 2015, again, another two years later, Counterterrorism and Security Act. What does it say? It says that Every single public sector worker has a duty to report on a child that they, being, that they believe is being drawn into radicalization. That means your doctors, your, your dentists, your nurses, your opticians. Every single person that has a position of public care now has to report on their child. But based on what? Based on random markers that they give you, whether or not the child's feeling depressed, whether or not the child makes a bit too much excitement, whether they're a transient phase of life, what we call puberty, right? All of these become markers. But who are the people who are being asked to do this? Public sector. 
The same public sector that has the Daily Mail and the Sun as the most two popular newspapers, the Times, the Telegraph, these newspapers that, that only express violent hatred towards immigrants and Muslims. And so we're asking to put our trust in the unconscious bias and the blatant bias of the public sector in determining whether or not they see our own children as risks. So when a child goes into school wearing the words Abu Bakr, a Siddiq number one on his back, he gets reported because the teacher is too stupid to understand that it doesn't mean Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. This is a reality, this is a true case. That family's life is destroyed because the police raid the house saying counter-terrorism, we need to raid you. So these reports have a serious significance because now that child's relationship to the state is changed forever, to the teachers is changed forever. A child who came to us at Cage uh, said that I went to the doctor because I had a problem with my leg. I had a pain in my leg and the doctor started asking about ISIS. The child said, I will never go to a doctor again. His health is now at risk for the rest of his life because his fear of the state has been elevated to such an extent that he has too much anxiety to even have his health problems dealt with. There is a fundamental breach of the sacred relationship between teachers and doctors and healthcare professionals and our children. And us as a larger society. And now we know of children who are actually being taken away from their parents through the family court process. Again, in order for a parent to challenge the system, they have to go through the same secret courts that I spoke about. The same ones that we didn't effectively challenge in 2001 because it only was against immigrant Muslims. Now it's being used, that same system is being used against us as Muslim nationals of this country. So in, in a way, we're partly to blame for not having effectively dealt with a with a system of injustice that was affecting others when it was easy for us to say, oh, well, that's not us, that's them. But now it's affecting us. And so I end by just saying, it is almost impossible to quantify the long-term psychological and physiological implications that this war on terror as an impact is not just having on our lives, but on the lives of our children who are, having to, or who are being forced to negotiate the violence of this war on terror. And when I mean violence, I mean all types of violence. The violence of being stopped in the street by a police officer simply because you look the, look the wrong color or being suspected by your teacher because they don't understand your cultural belief systems. This is all violence. And we're allowing our children to grow up in a violent world because we're refusing to acknowledge the fact that this is a system and a structure of Islamophobia that is slowly killing us day by day.